Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to hold on uh, for a couple more minutes to allow everybody to come in. Great. Okay, so I can see that we're raking up the numbers in our participant list. So um, I think now that it's 11.02, uh, we'll crack on. So uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the third in a series of Community Land Scotland's Meet the Pioneers webinars. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on community-led housing. Um, on uh, the 11th of November, Community Land Scotland published this report, Home Delivery, um, which took the opportunity to tell some of the inspiring stories of delivery that's been happening in communities in Scotland with the support, uh, particularly of the Rural Housing Fund, and also to look at some of the wider social benefit that comes to communities uh, in significant housing needs by the delivery of these projects. Um, so today we're going to hear uh, from four panellists, um, three of whom are working on uh, projects that are featured as, as case studies within the Community Land Scotland report. Uh, we're going to hear from Helen MacDonald, uh, who's the housing project officer uh, for Mull and Iona Community Trust. Um, and uh, Helen also had the joy of pulling together all the case studies for uh, the report, and they will appear soon on Community Land Scotland's website. Uh, we're going to hear from Hugh Ross from Staffin Community Trust on Sky, whose community light housing project is currently on site. Um, we're going to hear from Julia Muir Watt from All Roads Lead to Whithorn in the Mackers here in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and uh, thereafter, we're also going to hear uh, from Tim Crabtree, who's going to give us a, a perspective from south of the border. Uh, Tim comes from Wessex Community Assets, uh, who are an organisation who enable and research and do many other things around community light housing uh, across the southwest of England. Um, I'm Mike Staples. Uh, I'm the chief executive of South of Scotland Community Housing, what was formerly uh, Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust, uh, and I'm an, also a, a board member at Community Land Scotland. Um, so we're going to have a short presentation uh, from each of our participants, and then we'll move into a panel discussion. And at the end, we're going to have a, a, a question and answer session. So for uh, the audience today, um, you are able to use the Q&A box, which you will see at uh, the bottom of the screen. Uh, and you can use this to ask questions throughout the course of the webinar. And we're going to hold those questions uh, until the end and we'll put them to speakers. And if you have a question for a specific speaker, can you please write on your question who, uh, 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 in the box who the question is for? One final comment is that we're going to be recording today's webinar. Uh, and thereafter, it will be available to watch on Community Land Scotland's Vimeo channel. Um, so we're going to crack on uh, immediately by introducing Helen MacDonald from Mull, 
uh, who's going to tell us uh, a bit about um, uh, the Ulva Ferry housing project now uh, in its second phase. Okay, thank you, Helen. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everybody. Um, so I've been working as housing project officer at Malanaina Community Trust since 2014. And in that time, we've delivered our first housing project in 2017, which is these two houses at Alva Ferry here in Mull. And we're now in the thick of our second project, building four more houses at Alva Ferry. After a lot of hurdles with our first project, this time around has been pretty straightforward. And, and that's really what I was going to concentrate on today. Um, I think mainly because we've got the benefit of experience, but also this project has been entirely designed around the two main sources of funding available, which is the Scottish Land Fund and Rural Housing Fund. And we received feasibility funding from both those funds and used that to gather all the information and evidence we would need uh, for the two, uh, two main funding applications. So the land fund covered uh, the cost of a topographical survey, land valuations, engineer report, flood risk assessment and um, water investigations, while the rural housing fund covered outline architect designs, pre-planning advice and quantity surveyor costings. We held a lot of community consultation events, lots of individual discussions locally as well. And at this stage, many groups would opt to pay a consultant to oversee uh, the consultation and write the business plan but in this instance I just felt I knew the area and the people and the background to the project well enough and there was funding for my post so I opted to do that myself. The outcome of all this detailed feasibility work was producing a really robust business plan which resulted in a successful application to the Scottish Land Fund and um, we bought a plot in September 2018 and had a celebration event as part of Community Land Week last year when we were planting trees as in these pictures. Um, we were keen to explore options for modular build this time and our tender was designed so either a traditional or a modular contractor could apply and we did receive tenders from both sectors and the Wee House Company were the successful bidders. They prefabricate houses in their Ayrshire factory and whilst carrying out site work simultaneously and then the houses are taken to site for completion. So once we'd agreed a price with the Wee House Company, we then concentrated on the requirements of the Rural Housing Fund and what the maximum grant offer might be based on rent levels and sustainability. So things like our 25 year cash flow was realistic, it was really detailed so we could fully understand what level of borrowing we could afford. We aimed for the greener credentials, uh, building warrant credentials that the Rural Housing Fund offer additional funding towards. So we worked that those requirements into our tender document right from the start. We asked our contractor to pull out the total infrastructure costs relevant to our island location, which is actually a third of our total build cost. And we evidenced that in our application. And we just submitted a huge amount of uh, evidence of local housing need as well. As a result, we were awarded 778,000 from the Rural Housing Fund in February and along with a grant from our Island Butte Council and a mortgage with Ecology Building Society. That was our very straightforward funding package and work started on site in September. So we have a really good relationship with the Wee House Company. We've had a few site issues as, as we all do, but they have been able to deal with them all and we haven't had to worry about any extra costs because we have a design and build contract with them and that's a real relief to not have to worry about finding the extra funding. The build's really quick and um, the houses are ready to go in the factory. This first top photo on the left shows one of our houses split into modules and wrapped up ready for transportation. Then they're taken on lorries um, and delivered to site and craned into position. So our houses will be finished by February and we've had a lot of interest. I've sent out over 40 application packs so far for four houses. Um, in terms of management, we've decided to do this all ourselves and uh, we're a registered private landlord. We're also members of the Scottish Association of Landlords, which I would really recommend doing. Um, and we do have support from our local housing association when we need it and they help with our allocations as well. Our allocations have been really straightforward because we, we've done it before, but I would say allocations need a lot of consideration and uh, a lot of community consultation. 
Um, there's other options such as looking at a local lettings initiative with a local housing association and it just acts as an extra layer of um, agreed priorities on top of their own standard criteria. But having an objective policy um, with a point system avoids bringing any subjectivity to the decision making. So our first uh, project increased the primary school role by over 50%. Um, our tenants support the very local economy and community activities, but more generally, I think there's just a real sense of achievement and pride within the community that we can do this and um, achieve our aspirations and our new houses will build on all, that, all those benefits. So just in summary, I think for the best chances of success with the community-led housing project, robust feasibility work is essential to inform your business plan and provide all the evidence you'll need for your funding applications, just to give you a good solid start. Involve the community at every stage, but also manage expectations. Um, community-led housing takes a long time to come to fruition and an employed project officer will really drive the project forward on and it'll avoid volunteer fatigue. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Helen. Um, okay, so uh, uh, we're um, now going to pass over to uh, Hugh Ross from Staffing on Sky. Um, good morning, Hugh. Hi, Mike. Sorry, T6. Okay. Hi, Mike. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I'll uh, just uh, go through the, our own project here, which um, uh, start, we started on site uh, just in August past, um, but this project is, has been a bit of a saga. Um, it's actually six years in the making. Um, Staffing is in the, the north end of Sky, a community of about 500 people. Um, one of the issues that we've had here is Petrie, the capital of Sky, is just up the road, half an hour uh, south, and there was a major um, housing development in the last decade in Petrie. Uh, an old farm called Home Farm Petrie was uh, sold off and about 250 houses were built in Petrie. Um, and at the same time, there wasn't much, very, there wasn't any affordable house, housing uh, getting built in Staffan since 1999. So this was in 2014. Uh, the Staffan Trust were worried. The school role was plummeting, their population was falling. Similar problems to you know, the rest of the West Highlands, um, holiday homes, losing families and young people to Petrie. Uh, so the trust decided to try and do something about it. Uh, from that, we kind of followed a similar path to other communities. Uh, the Highland Small Communities Housing Trust uh, uh, got involved uh, uh, to support us. We did an affordable housing survey, which identified the need. We had a meeting with all the, the various agencies, which we, which we kind of, uh, publicizes a summit to try and get uh, you know a bit of interest and kind of um, uh, focus the kind of powers that be to kind of help us. Uh, so that was back in 2014. So from that we had uh, we kind of joined forces with the Highland Small Communities Housing Trust and La and Sky Housing Association and uh, came up with a project which has got six three bedroom houses, uh, a new health center and two uh, business units. Um, our reasoning being that we don't get much opportunities to kind of deliver projects of this size and we thought we may as well try and get as much into it as possible. Um, the Highland Housing Trust has been um, a great supporter from, from day one with this, as has the Housing Association. Um, but they also get, you know, the community buy-in. Um, one of the things the Housing Association said to me was that they struggle to get um, suitable land and staffing. And we are now building on a common grazing, which is poor ground. And, um, you know, that, that's a, a first for Staffan. It's saving the kind of good quality in by ground, but it's not been within its own problems, which, you know, can maybe come, come onto in the, in the panel discussion. Uh, in terms of funding, 
we've gone down, you know, a similar route to everybody else. The Scottish Land Fund, the Rural Housing Fund, HIE are helping us with the infrastructure costs for the business unit. Um, we also were fortunate to get money from LIDA uh, before Brexit, uh, a quarter of a million pounds. Um, and I kind of felt there was quite a, a real lack of kind of capital funding about. Uh, the other thing that we tried was crowdfunding. Uh, last uh, September, we got quite a lot, a lot of publicity for that, and uh, we raised seven thousand pounds, which you know was seven thousand pounds we didn't have before. But um, I felt we could have done a lot. Well, I was aiming for about forty thousand pounds. We were going after uh, Hollywood uh, companies, of film and staff, and there's a lot of work up here at the Kerrang and the store and various kind of productions. Also, coach tour companies. There's 30 different bus companies that are coming through here. And I also wrote to every uh, clan society in North uh, America and Australia and Canada, uh, the Gillises, the McLeods, the Nicholsons, the Beatons, uh, McDonald's, and uh, asked them not to forget their cousins back home. Uh, that didn't yield much, but uh, our kind of diaspora across the UK actually did come to the kind of fore. So that, that was quite an eye opener, but we learned a lot with that. Um, our experience of working with uh, contractors, we're obviously just on site at the moment. Um, this site's on poor PT ground, common grazing. So the groundworks has been very expensive. A lot of peat has come out of the ground, but thankfully the, um, the fines were dug just last, last week and the concrete's getting poured as we speak. Um, you know, that's something to be aware of that, you know, the conditions of the ground and the sites are, that the trust might the trust might get hold of um, aren't always the best. Um, the contractor is well known for working in Sky. We, we've got an issue with them at the moment about additional costs. Helen referred there to the design and build um, type of contract, which in layman's uh, terms, I understand as basically there's no extra costs with that. Uh, and it's a set kind of uh, price, but we're, we're having kind of discussions with them at the moment about um, an additional um, uh, groundworks that they've incurred. Um, my, my own kind of experience of working with the contractor is I'm obviously involved in all the team's meetings and emails, etc., cetera, with, with the site uh, manager. However, you know, I kind of stress that um, I don't have a construction background. The Highland Small Communities Housing Trust and the Haas and Sky do, and we've got an employer's agent for, for the kind of build. Um, so that's what I would kind of say is the trust kind of brings obviously the local knowledge. You know, we can get access to land that perhaps other organisations can't. We, we know the local sensitivities, you know, we know who, to, who can help us, but, you know, we, you also have to, um, you know, you know, we're involved with these sort of organisations for a reason that they've been over the course many times before and uh, they, they know what they're doing. Uh, that's not to say that the trust doesn't question, you know, uh, any, you know, issues that come up. That, that's maybe the strength and uh, perhaps the weakness of the project in, in the sense that we've got three different organisations all working together, but it makes things slightly more protracted if there's kind of uh, decisions that come up. Um, and then, uh, the final, you know, query is about the process of getting tenants for the houses. Um, when we started this in 2014, people were asking us, you know, will there be houses built? Uh, that's now changed to when the houses are obviously going to be open. And at the moment, I've got 16 expressions of interest from families and 20 something, 30 something, you know, individuals and staff who are looking for, you know, the, the houses. Uh, one of the uh, interesting parts of this is that we're building a health centre and we're also looking to purchase the current clinic um, from NHS Highland and that will become the seventh house of this development. Um, so, you know, there's going to be people that are disappointed, but, you know, we, we, the trust houses are geared at providing, um, you know, families and uh, children for the school, increase their population, which went down by 40 people in just four years and uh, you know basically lowering the average age of our kind of population so you know we're, we're confident that when the development's ready and open it will be a, a massive uh, you know, boost for our community so uh, that's uh, me mike great thank you um 
Okay, can we uh, move um, now seamlessly on to Julia, please? Julia, good morning. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I am one of the directors of the All Roads Lead to Whithorn Charitable Trust, and we are a very small trust of only six directors right down in the south of Scotland. Um, affordable housing is just one of our developments at the moment, um, but it is going to be the first on site. So we're a little bit uh, at a previous stage than the other two speakers. Uh, next slide, Kerry, please. So just to give you a quick insight, um, we grew up out of a community consultation. That's how we got our long name, the All Roads Lead to Whithorn Trust, um, because it was a film consultation and we asked the community, what did they think of the past of Whithorn, the present and the future? And this is a little shot of our film uh, being shown to the community back all the way back in 2013. Um, just as a historical aside, the reason that all roads lead to Whithorn is that it was a pilgrimage site in the Middle Ages and literally over the south of Scotland, all roads did in fact lead to Whithorn. It was in fact one of the most um, frequented sites in Scotland at the time. Next slide, please. So we are in a slightly different situation from the previous two speakers. Um, our town is also a small community, is only about 900 people, let's say, uh, but it is in effect a built up area. It's a royal borough and our site, which you can see designated with a red arrow, is right almost geographically in the middle of the outstanding conservation area. That gives us all sorts of challenges. Um, most of our houses are listed uh, for about three quarters of a mile and most of them date to the 18th century. Um, some radical new builds date to the Victorian era, but in effect, it's an 18th century town which overlies a medieval uh, settlement. And you can see the strange sort of shape it has, which would have once accommodated a market. Um, and you can see the burgage plots out at the back, which were once for growing crops. So we, um, our site has a front building where um, in medieval times you were permitted to build, and then it has a long backlands. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what it looks like in the palmy days when it was a hotel. Um, as everybody knows, hotels have had a very hard time, uh, not just under COVID, but really since um, cheap flights abroad. But up into the 50s, it was kind of a focus for the town. Um, you can see it has a, a double frontage. Um, and then at the end of the long backlands plot, <clears throat> it has the what was the the stables uh, for the hotel and possibly it was at one point a brewery for the inn as well. Um, next slide please. So this is what it looks like right now um, and it doesn't look too bad and that is because it had a major investment of Historic Environment Scotland grant back in 2009. Um, I was one of the people who sort of fought to get an investment in it. Before that it was actually boarded up and that caused hue and cry in the local community. As you can see, all our houses are really a terrace um, and one is attached to the other. So you can imagine what it's like being attached to a derelict building. But the car scheme only went so far. It um, renewed uh, all the windows and uh, the roof, but um, there was nothing inside. It's literally a shell. Next slide, please. So you can see there's a whole list of failures for the last 28 years, effectively. Um, our council tried, a social landlord tried, private developers purchased the property and um, went so far, but unfortunately only to a um, shell stage. So that's when we moved on to purchase it ourselves because nobody else could. Uh, next slide, please. So we went and we um, got in touch with Mike and Stacy at what was Dumfries and Galloway Small Community Housing Trust. Like other people, we went um, and we got a feasibility study funds from the Rural Housing and uh, Community Land Scotland and we acquired an architect and we also carried out um, community consultations on the size of properties that were needed. Next slide, please. 
So these are our designs. As I say, we're at an earlier stage than the previous two speakers, but we designed two family houses. We have very similar concerns. We want to keep young people. Our school role is relatively healthy, but not as healthy as it used to be. So about 100 children, but we find that young families are moving out uh, and young people uh, tend to go elsewhere. So our aim has been to have two largish houses with three bedrooms, which is what we found to be the most popular option. We also have a high priority for um, energy um, efficiency because Guitorn has a terrible record. It's in the top 5% of for fuel poverty. Next slide, please. So this is just a sort of summing up of where we've been and it sounds somewhat similar to the other um, panelists, but obviously we had the property valued um, and we had to negotiate with private owners, which made it quite tricky went through the business plan, acquired a panoply of advisors, that's accountants, solicitors, VAT advisors. We've been through planning and building warrant applications this year and had to give it a bit of a nudge because it was going rather slowly. Um, we are now at the point where tender packages are being prepared. They will go out in the next couple of weeks and then we will um, hope to be on the ground during winter um, and then into the spring and summer next year, and then we will face the delights of allocation, which some of the other speakers have alluded to. So that's, I think, a quick run through of where, where we've been and where we are. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. And finally, um, good morning, Tim. Um, I, I am going to ask you to, to um, somehow succinctly describe what Wessex community assets do within the space of five minutes, which may be a challenge, but uh, um, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so Wessex community assets, we are um, a community benefit society, um, so a social enterprise uh, set up about 20 years ago by um, myself and some other colleagues who were kind of active in social enterprises, but struggling to access, to access workspace, struggling to access finance. And so we set up a kind of secondary organization to support the activities that we were doing on the ground. Um, so I've been involved, as I say, for about 20 years. Um, I'm also involved, I'm the um, chair of a community housing group in the town that I live in called Bridport, and I'll, if I have the time, uh, I'll get to that at the end. Um, I just wanted to start by um, pointing out this report, which I think is still quite an important report. It was um, written about 20 years ago by the New Economics Foundation, and um, it introduced the idea of community land trusts to, um, to the UK. And in particular, it said, I mean, it kind of looked at the sort of legal situation here, and I'm conscious that England is different to Scotland, um, but it said, how do we bring a community housing practice from America and the continent to a UK context? And in particular, it was focused on affordable home ownership, and I might come on to that during the discussion, but I would recommend this report, it's still, I think, relevant. So um, we currently run um, the Wessex Community Housing Hub. So we have funding um, from the Community Housing Fund, which again, I realize is only an English fund. Um, and we provide support to um, quite a number of projects. So we work across Devon, Dorset and Somerset. Um, we've supported 20 communities to complete their projects. That's about 200 houses. And there are about 40 in progress at the moment. Um, so when we started um, the sort of first decade, we um, a lot of these projects were quite pioneering and had to kind of navigate quite a difficult terrain really to get their houses uh, done. Um, Again, in England, we have, I think, a, a, a more difficult kind of uh, legal framework for social housing. And so these initial projects had to establish themselves as housing associations to be able to draw down 
capital funding from what what is now Homes England. And so the one at the bottom, for example, High Bickington Community Land Trust, this was a community where the county council was disposing of a county farm. And so the community demanded that they have some benefit from the disposal and it became a housing association managed to develop about 50 houses, but it took them 12 years. Um, the Buckland Newton one took about seven years. So the last 10 years, we have focused um, in particular on partnering up community housing groups, particularly community land trusts, with housing associations. Uh, so this example is uh, a passive house development um, in the Dartmoor National Park. Uh, the community, again, this thing about fuel poverty, they said there's no point providing affordable housing if they're not affordable to run. And so the community demanded and managed to secure additional funding um, for them to be passive house. So this is the sort of spread um, of our projects. Um, and we have a number of advisors who support community groups across that area. Um, this is some of the community housing groups that we supported. And these, this is the range of housing associations that we're working with. I think one of the, again, this might come up in the discussion, but one of the uh, challenges that we're facing now is that most of the housing associations are becoming reluctant to work on projects less than 10 houses. But actually quite a number of our uh, schemes are actually smaller than that. You know, there might be five or eight, five to eight houses, and it's becoming harder to persuade housing associations to get involved. And these are some of the houses that we uh, have supported getting uh, built. And I won't talk about this, but this is the sort of mechanism by which a um, community housing group would work with a housing association to acquire a site and then develop it. But essentially, uh, most of the schemes to date um, have been on exception sites um, outside the, the boundary of the village or the town. Um, and basically that depresses the cost of the land. And it, so then the community land trust will work with the housing association, which will actually pro provide the funding to purchase the land. The freehold is held by the community land trust and that land is then leased back to the housing association. Um, I've just got uh, two or three examples. Um, Mike said it might be interesting to say something about bigger uh, communities. Um, so this one, this is uh, in Chagford. Um, so this is a development of about 100 homes, um, developer led. Um, but the local community housing group managed to negotiate for 28 of the houses to be uh, given to the community land trust uh, once the development was complete and then for a housing association to manage those houses. Um, this is Creekmore, which is a part of Poole, uh, which is quite a large town in Dorset. Um, and here, this was a site that is owned by the council, uh, which is now Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole Council. And they've agreed to, um, to donate um, the housing at very low cost um, to the community land trust. And it's gonna be delivered in partnership with Bournemouth Church's Housing Association. And then this is another example of a council owning land, which they're prepared to make available to a housing, uh, group. So in this case, uh, it was some tennis courts which were no longer being used and uh, they've been made available to the Community Land Trust and the Community Land Trust decided that they wanted to focus on younger people, uh, so people up to the age of 35 employed in Dorchester. Um, and then the last example, the last sort of uh, town example, this is uh, Tor Bay, where I've been working. Um, so we got involved initially um, because the local authority wanted to address the issue of homelessness in the town. Um, 
they wanted to promote a housing first approach, which is rather than putting people into hostels, you give them uh, accommodation straight away. So uh, there was a workshop, about 50 people attended. Out of that, a community housing group, Growing Homes Tall Bay has been set up. And we decided that our first um, focus would be the purchase and refurbishment of um, shops, which could then uh, have affordable housing above. And the reason why we focused on shops is because we can create a maker space below that the community can use as a base for doing the refurbishment. So we're very interested in a kind of co-production model where local people get involved. And, and in terms of financing, uh, we're going to do a share offer following the example of, for example, Brighton and Hove Community Land Trust. Um, and we're also talking to the council about them borrowing some money from the Public Works Loan Board and then on lending it to the group. Um, and then finally, because I live in Bridport, just a couple of examples. We've worked with the Bridport co-housing group uh, on a feasibility study for a solar PV microgrid. And uh, you know, I'm conscious that there are community enterprises in Scotland that have got involved in uh, renewable energy, community renewables, and there is possibilities of linking together community renewables with uh, community-led housing. Um, but then in terms of the actual housing work that we're involved in, um, we're again particularly interested in how do you link uh, the local resources that we have, particularly timber, link it to the local economy through off-site construction um, and then using that to create sustainable housing. And there's a very large housing development that we're hoping to, um, it's about 760 houses and we're hoping to be allocated the affordable housing element of that that we can then develop uh, affordable housing on. So I'll I'll finish there. I had a few more slides. Uh, I was just going to um, show the in last month we did quite a nice project working with unemployed people uh, to make a tiny house again linked to uh, our housing first work. And uh, so one of the things we're very interested in is how do you actually engage people in the actual process of construction. And perhaps we can talk about that in the uh, discussion. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Tim, and uh, thank you to everybody for some uh, really um, interesting uh, and inspiring perspectives. Um, so uh, we're now going to have a, a, a panel discussion um, until a uh, about 10 past, uh, we seem uh, obviously are, are appearing to have um, quite a broad array of questions coming in uh, from the audience on, on the Q&A. So we'll, we'll try and cut this session off um, uh, at, at 10 past. And uh, I'm gonna start by asking you guys um, quite a basic question. Um, what led your group to consider embarking on a community-led housing project in the first place. Uh, and I'm going to ask Helen to start, please. Um, it was the threat and closure of uh, the local primary school. I think there were four pupils at the time back in 2010 that led the community to sort of get themselves together and um, fight to keep the school open. And as part of that, they realized that the reason families were moving away is just there was no affordable housing um, to either rent or to buy in the area. And that was the catalyst for it all. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hugh. Um, just really what, I would, sorry, uh, Mike, just really what I was saying in the presentation, um, it's 1999 since we last had affordable houses built here. And um, well, two, uh, 2014 was when we kind of kicked off this project. So next year will be 21 years since we had any houses, which is a whole generation. Um, and similar to other communities, you know, our population was declining. School roll was going down and we were seeing a drift of people away to kind of places like Portree uh, for kind of affordable housing. Okay, great. Um, Julia. 
Um, I think we didn't initially see ourselves as getting engaged in housing. We had some other projects, uh, one big one for a community hall and bunkhouse. So it was really, I think, responding to community concern or indeed anger about this particular building um, and seeing that it constantly went through different initiatives and failures and different public authorities, social landlords and indeed private owners. And in the end, if we didn't do anything about it, it just wouldn't get fixed and it would be a running sore. So it was literally a, a quite a reactive process. Um, thanks. Uh, Tim, there, there appears to be a really sort of significant level of demand for community light housing in, in Southwest England. And obviously you're, you're referencing having worked in, in your organization and in this sector for over a period of, of 20 years, but um, what, what do you think has catalyzed this, this level of kind of sectoral growth around community led housing? Um, and is it being exacerbated? I mean, I think that, you know, we're, we're really acutely aware of the, the, the impacts of the pandemic on the housing market here in rural Scotland at the moment. And we're reading about a lot of the same type of stuff going on in Southern England as, as well. And, um, uh, you know, is, is that exacerbating, do you think, the, the, the demand for community like housing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there has been both this kind of people fleeing the bigger urban areas to, you know, come to the rural, you know, sort of more kind of perceived rural places like the Southwest. Um, yeah, I mean, going back more historically, um, we've had a lot of sort of retired people coming in, increasing amounts of second homes and now Airbnb, and obviously then the sell-off of a lot of the social housing. So that's obviously um, affected things. I mean, I think the, um, I mean, as I said in my presentation, most of the early projects were done on rural exception sites, and that clearly has been a big factor. Um, so with a rural exception site, um, there is a cap put on how much each plot can be sold for. Um, the cap is usually about 10,000, but we, we normally negotiate that for about 7,000. Um, so clearly um, where local authorities have got a policy that is supportive of that kind of rural exception approach, that's obviously unlocked those sites and I think housing associations um, haven't had a very good reputation in a lot of smaller communities <clears throat> because of um, the kind of allocations policies that they've applied to the housing that they've developed and I think um, where communities have seen that um, you know, the, the allocation policy for a community land trust development on a rural exception site will favour people with a connection to that town or that village. It makes people more, um, yeah, more kind of accepting of that kind of approach. And I think also the fact that the housing won't be subject to right to buy also means that land owners are more likely to bring those sites forward. Um, so I think that that's, that's probably the reason why, you know, we've seen a sort of a growth. Um, and I think you also get this kind of um, networking effect. So in West Dorset, where I live, there's now something like 10 community housing groups in quite a small area, um, because one village can look to the next village and see that, you know, that village has produced eight or 10 houses and they want to do themselves. Um, so that's probably why you know, we have seen this growth. Um, I could, yeah, another time I could say some of the drawbacks of that. I wouldn't say it's all rosy. Great. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. And, and I think that, you know, some of those those issues of, of momentum um, are, are quite pertinent to, to, to um, some of our conversations recently around Community Land Scotland and, and the continuation of the Rural Housing Fund that um, that, that interest has, has built as communities have delivered through the fund. Um, uh, Hugh, Helen and Julia, you all talked about uh, your projects delivering using um, 
in tandem, the Scottish Land Fund and, and the Rural Housing Fund. Um, uh, I think largely we've we found these to be positive experiences, but I, I, I was keen to ask each of you um, what uh, specifically, what specific obstacles you may have encountered through the course of planning and delivery of your project. Um, what were these and, and, and how have they been overcome? Um, and you can perhaps also relate this to, to construction. I know that, that one thing we, we find quite challenging in the south of Scotland is a, con is a construction market and, and finding smaller um, local contractors uh, to made reference there to, to engaging the community in the construction process. But broadly speaking, uh, obstacles. Helen, I'm going to start with you again. Um, not so much recently, but certainly earlier with our first project, um, proving housing need to organisations that rely on social housing waiting lists as their main source of, main source of evidence is quite hard because those waiting lists don't show the full pictures on, in rural areas, particularly of hidden homelessness or take into account the many reasons why people won't go on housing list. So that's quite hard. And when people tell you from outside uh, your area that there's no housing need in your community, it's quite frustrating. Um, so to sort of counter that, we have just had lots of local evidence of housing needs. So we've done um, housing needs surveys and spoken to local businesses who are struggling to recruit staff purely on the housing issue uh, and sort of various other things. So it's just lots and lots of evidence of collective and individual experiences. Um, securing funding is always an issue. Um, convincing funders that it's just more expensive to build rurally and to build on an island it's even more expensive and and there's a shortage of contractors so getting three quotes is difficult at the best of times and and that's just just the way it is and um so again we've just had to like i said just we got our contractor just to pull out evidence of every single cost that was related to our build so whether that was commercial ferry fares or the fact we had to sink a borehole for water or whatever it was, it was just providing that evidence. And um, again, first time round, uh, one issue we had, it was funding all these unexpected costs, like Hugh says, your, your groundworks, all these things that you, you just you can't plan for and you can have a certain amount of contingency. But when you're told just about on completion that you need to build a fire pond for your houses that you hadn't planned on doing, and didn't know where to put it, or you've got to have an archaeological survey or a bat survey, all these things that you don't really prepare for, that's quite a challenge. Sorry, thank you, Helen. Um, Hugh, can I ask you the same question, please? Yeah, sure, uh, Mike. Um, way back at the start when we had the call for sites, um, we had about six, seven sites uh, proposed. Um, I had the planners down here at the Housing Association um, council officials, just looking at all the pros and cons of each of the sites. Um, I saw a question from uh, Lisa over at Golson there about why the Housing Association was concentrating building in, in the likes of Portree. And, you know, it's basically because costs, like Helen are saying, are higher in places like Staffan. And the, it's the availability of land. We're surrounded by land here, but there's so much restrictions with um, crofting law. Um, so, when we had the call for sites, we had several sites that were on in by kind of crofts. Um, the commission, the crofting commission, wasn't keen on them, and the site that we uh, preferred was, you know, we weren't losing any uh, real, you know, agricultural quality kind of ground. Uh, so when we progressed um, the project, uh, the Central Township, there's um, about 14 shareholders there. And one uh, chap who only had a half share of the township was quite awkward, refused to approve the development. And it was then uh, went to the, the land court for their consideration, the Scottish land court. And this is just an example. Uh, it was about a, almost about 18 months ago. And they, it was within their right, you know, did they need to hold a hearing? And they decided that they wanted to hold a, hold a hearing. So they traveled up from Edinburgh about 
eight months after we try applied to resume the, the, the site, which is taking out of Crofton tenure. So we had the land court hearing last uh, December in the sheriff court. We all had to attend. We were all very smartly dressed. It was <laughs> a big day and the objector never turned up for the hearing. And, you know, he, uh, we, we won, we got the resumption approved. And when I say we won, uh, the legal costs were £9,600 and that tenant didn't have to pay one single penny. So the trust then had to scramble around. Uh, this, this is where the land fund were very helpful. Uh, we had obviously allocated costs under statutory service, etc. But we didn't need a bat server, thankfully. So we would, we managed to um, plug that hole. But that that is one example of you know the problems we've had. Um, you had a whole township there, fourteen people, all all supportive of it, and one one person, effectively, I would say, abusing the system. Uh, the other problem we've got here is we're in a national scenic area, uh, so there's a designation that blankets the whole of staff, and we're surrounded by the Chortness Ridge, uh, the Old Man of Store, and the Kerrang. And when we had the call for sites, uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, I invited the officer down. I looked after him, made some cups of tea and all the rest. And uh, he looked at the site and said he didn't like it because it was going to impact on the view of the Trotness Ridge. I could understand if that, if it was a kind of a sky rise, but it was only six houses. So we were at log loggerheads of SNH for quite a while. We had to get very political and lobby at the highest level and eventually they kind of um, said that they weren't going to object but that we lost 18 months to that so between that 18 months and that and then you know the best part of the year on the, the crofting um uh, the, the land court that, that was two big uh, points that we lost uh, mike which um it's very, it's all very well for authorities authorities to say that they want to empower rural communities but I mean, the red tape and bureaucracy and, you know, the regulations that are there at the moment aren't, aren't helpful in, in the slightest. Okay, thank you. That, those are some pretty um, significant obstacles that you face there, uh, Hugh. So, I, Julia, can I ask you this, the same question about obstacles? Um, <clears throat> I suppose several. I mean, internally, we have the issue that all of us are volunteers. We don't have staff. So everything that we do has been carried out um, just in our own time. And uh, suddenly the sort of um, officers of the charity are working full time on other things. So just when you don't want it in your own working life, then there comes the need to complete the business plan or some other application. So that that's just a sort of internal um, limit that we have, but we have coped. And, you know, that's partly due to um, help from the Small Communities Housing Trust. Um, external obstacles, I suppose the site is in the midst of the outstanding conservation area, as I mentioned, uh, it's extremely tightly controlled. So we knew, we, we know that in our day-to-day -day lives that no alterations can take place externally. And that was why the first two um, proposals for the site failed because they actually proposed demolition. So we already knew that, that it would have to be a very conservative design. Um, and apart from that, I guess there's the sort of local expectations that we have to manage. Um, there is already some excitement about the houses, but you know, the first phase is only two. Then we hope to have second phase development in the backlands where there's going to be um, single level housing and potentially housing for uh, disabled people. But it's a small development and um, the speed at which things move is not necessarily uh, what local people expect. Um, and of course, we've got to move at the speed of the funders too. So delays on planning um, don't have a positive impact when the funders are expecting you to commit by a certain date. So we did have to use some political pressure um, and some strings that we could pull to make the planners come up with a with a verdict during COVID when they were working from home. So I guess that was a, an added little challenge. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, we all have experience of um, the strange expectation that somehow community-led housing projects will deliver significantly more quickly than anybody else's housing projects will, but uh, that's another issue. Um, some of the narrative that, that we've been very aware of around the Rural Housing Fund has, has, has related to numbers, unit numbers, and 
I mentioned at the outset that you know, one of the, the objectives of the Community Land Scotland report was to, to think about the wider benefits to communities beyond uh, the delivery of number of houses. What are, what are the wider social benefits of, of community-led housing? Um, so I'm going to ask you guys to touch upon that from the experience of your own projects. Tim, um, I know this is, this is an area that's, that's been looked at um, in, in England quite a lot, and we, we were um, aware of some of the work that the CLT network had, had done, done around the, the, the wider benefits, but um, I know that you guys also work around social enterprise as well as the housing. Um, so can, can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, I think I, I would probably preface that by saying that, you know, obviously there are different types of community led housing project and they kind of fall into two broad categories so i think one category would be i mean certainly in the work that we're doing the broad category would be on the one hand community housing groups that are providing housing for a particular defined group and then other types of community housing project where it's more of a, a sort of mutual or cooperative type of approach whether it's co-housing or community self-build or um, cooperatives and obviously that's going to impact on the kind of benefits that can be delivered because I mean again if you look at Europe for example um, they don't talk about community-led housing they talk about collaborative housing and in that housing um, a lot of it will be people working together to um, deliver their own, you know, against their own housing needs. And so the benefits, apart from just delivering the housing, are around community development, increased cohesion, those kind of things. So I think that that's something to bear in mind. And it sounds like in Scotland you don't have quite the issue that we have, which is that where particularly in rural areas, there's a sort of predominance of partnerships with housing associations. The problem is that, again, you get stuck in a bit of a um, kind of patrician type role where you're having to take what the housing association, you know, demands you, you know, to accept. Um, and also there's less actual kind of co-production in that process. So certainly we're not dismissing that area of work it's it's important for the areas we work in but I think uh, it's also important to to be looking at the benefits that can be delivered by a more kind of mutual approach I think beyond that um, I mean the reason why I'm involved in what's called Bridport area community homes is that we did some research uh, about three years ago looking at the numbers of houses that were going to be built in our area what the cost of that housing was going to be. It was going to be about 200 million because it's about a thousand houses. And we worked out that about 90 million of that is going to be spent on materials. But as it stands, none of that will be spent locally on locally sourced materials. And very few of the subcontractors will be local. And so We've been doing a lot of work over the last three years to explore how we can um, deliver local economic benefits from local housing. And obviously there, there are constraints, like Helen was saying, you know, maybe there aren't contractors locally that could do that. But I think the more that we can join up different agendas, uh, so housing plus local construction or housing plus the generation of renewable energy which is then linked to that housing the better really great uh, thank you um helen in in your presentation you you talked about the 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 impact on school role um which is is a, an obvious one but can you can you talk about and obviously um You've delved into this in, in a bit more detail, having done all the case studies for the Community Land Scotland report. But uh, can can you talk about a bit about your own experience of the the, the wider benefits um, on on Mull of delivering the housing? Yeah, yeah, I think um, it's just 
creating more sustainable communities with young and, and old people together. And as I say, the school role, um, there would only be three pupils in the primary school at Olive Ferry right now if it wasn't for our houses. And in two years time, there would only be one pupil. And so that concern about the future sustainability, and that's why partly why we've gone on to build more houses, but also, you know, more people supporting the local economy and um, opportunities for, for new business creation and um, and also so the wider benefits of the empowerment of the local community. Like I've seen people is feeling they've got this sense of pride and, and cohesion, like Tim mentioned, of being able to solve their own issues and feel that they can go on and deliver more projects, whether that's housing or, or otherwise. I think of all the groups I, I spoke to uh, for these case studies, pretty much everyone was keen to carry on and do more housing projects or other projects should the funding be available. And I think that shows that the confidence and the skills that people are gaining from, from carrying out these projects themselves. Great, thank you. Um, you, your project uh, on Sky is obviously about more than housing uh, alone. So you're bringing a, a range of, of benefits to a, an isolated location. Yeah, yes, Mike, um, as I was saying earlier on, that's made the project more complicated, but it's kind of made it more attractive to a range of different funders. It's just, um, I suppose, one thing for a trust to be aware of when you get to this side, it's dealing with all the different funders. It's, um, I, I have it up on my wall who who kind of provided all the funding, but then it's all the different kind of claims, etc. But in terms of uh, the community, it's obviously, you know, the social outcomes of, um, you know, six houses. So we're looking very close to the primary school. Um, I mean, SNH didn't like it because they said it was a ribbon development and out with the kind of centre of the village, but we kind of obviously disagreed. It's very close to the school, close to our local shops, the churches, um, you know, the cafes, etc. Um, the health centre, at the moment, NHS Highland have a, a surgery in staff and uh, once a week, one morning a week, we call it a surgery, it's basically a clinic. Uh, we want to have this health centre uh, used kind of every hour of the week, um, obviously with, pan, uh, with COVID as well. So a lot of our population uh, travel away to Inverness and Fort William for kind of relatively routine kind of appointments. So we're looking at what kind of digital technologies out there and how the health centre could be, you know, kitted out. Um, the business units, there's been a lot of interest in, in kind of, um, you know, uh, firms here, startups and potential new kind of shops there. So we want to see it as a kind of, I suppose, a bit of a hub. Um, you know, it's kind of people living there, working there, you know, getting kind of treated there. Uh, in terms of kind of social impacts, um, you know, anecdotally, you know, for example, you know, our men's football team used to compete in the Sky League. Um, we kind of had to, our team had to come out of the division a few years ago, just basically because of a lack of kind of males between the ages 16 and 40. Um, so that, that's the kind of things that we want to try and reverse here. Um, you know, this housing development, not, well, multi-use development, isn't going to do everything, but, you know, it's it's a big start. Uh, you know, it's, well, seven houses with the, 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 the kind of converted health surgery, which in theory should be seven families either, you know, continuing to stay here or coming into the area. Um, you know, so, you know, we're, we're hoping it will have an impact, but um, it, it's kind of long overdue, uh, Mike. Great, thank you very much. Um, Julia, um, your project is also right next to the primary school, um, and all roads lead to Whithorn are, are also doing lots of other things other than the, the, the housing in isolation. So can can you talk about your perceived impact of the, of the project on, on the town um, more broadly. Yes, I mean, I think um, this will be the first All Roads project that will have a sort of physical um, evident impact on the town. So um, local people have begun to notice that we've been doing things. That's a huge vote of confidence. Um, they feel encouraged that something's happening. Uh, although we're on the mainland, it is a remote spot and people do feel somewhat forgotten. Um, as I said in my presentation, we came out of a, a community consultation, so we knew what the areas of community anxiety were, and it was just about 
not feeling there was a future, that the, the old sort of priorities of being a market town or an agricultural center were changing because of technology and changed travel habits. So um, our projects are designed to show that there, there is a future. The other big project we're engaged upon is um, complete renovation of a, a Victorian town hall um, with a bunkhouse that will accommodate walkers and cyclists. And this housing project is literally almost across the road from that. And um, I think now funders are starting to see that there's a sort of mini regeneration plan for Whithorn, um, which has come together organically, but nonetheless, um, it's being recognized that we're dealing with funding, um, energy poverty, uh, outcomes for social life and long distance learning and education, um, which has been particularly highlighted by the recent crisis. So I think um, it's just an over, it's just one part of a sort of overall strategy for Whithorn. Excellent, thank you very much. So um, we've got four minutes to go of our uh, Q&A and I'm gonna close it out uh, by putting you all on the spot and I'm gonna give you ask you to answer in one minute, why is community-led housing important? Helen. Um, because in some areas it's it's the only option. Um, like I think it was Tim was saying, housing associations don't want the risk or the cost of building less than say 10 units in an area. And that, as we've shown, if just a few units can make such a difference in a very rural community. So, sometimes it's only community-led solutions that are going to happen and I think communities know best what their issues are and can often provide the most suitable solutions on a very small scale. Excellent, thank you. Hugh? Um, when Staff and Community Trust, um, I would say, started this back in 2014, um, it was never its intention to be building houses. It was always a project, uh, sorry, it was always an organization that was set up to facilitate, you know, businesses and um, other kind of projects in the area which would benefit the community. Um, but the board here uh, were just growing very, very frustrated at the lack of um, uh, house building in our area. There was about 25 houses in our community that were built in the last 10 years, private houses. And, um, you know, there was nothing happen happening for Know, the affordable housing sector so i would say that um you know it's vital for a community such as ours you know 2014 we had 18 uh, percent of second homes and imagine that figure has gone up now with airbnb and the rest and if i think the trust hadn't got involved in this then you know we'd have been lurching towards becoming a kind of um a community dominated by holiday homes uh, so i think that that's kind of been key and that's why the trust you know, dipped its toe into this because it's never owned land or assets up till now. So, and obviously that's come at the same time as the land fund, the rural housing fund, um, you know, came on stream. But it was high on small community housing trust that kind of, I suppose, opened the trust's eyes to what, you know, what was out there. And, you know, we wouldn't have got this far without them. And obviously the House and Sky Housing Association. So, you know, that's essentially how we're at this stage. Great, thank you. Um... Julia, can I ask you the same question, please? Um, I think I agree with Helen. It um, is simply sometimes the only solution, and um, it is, but it is also often the best solution because you find that local people um, who are locally based have the sort of passion for their community, and they have also the bloody mindedness that it will take to fight their way through the sort of lengthy process that we have to undergo and. Uh, survive disappointments and still come back and fight and in the end prevail and that's what we will hope to do. Excellent, thank you. Tim? Um, well in Julia's presentation she talked about market failure and I think that the problem with market-based solutions to housing is that they don't deliver, generally don't deliver what people really want and I think that community-led housing, it illustrates, you know, so much around the need, for example, to hold land in trust. If you can do that, then it can, you know, mean that housing can be affordable in perpetuity. So 
the way that the land and the housing market and the associated finance market works really doesn't deliver for people. And I think that community-led housing is sort of trying to find ways to address that generalized market failure. Perfect, thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, so we, we are gonna conclude our, our Q&A and, and um, suffice to say, there were a lot more questions uh, that remain unasked and uh, we, we might send some of those through to, to you guys afterwards, but we've also had quite a few questions from the audience today. Um, so we're gonna run through some of them. Um, the first question that came in was, was directed, I think towards Helen and, and asked, um, how did you fund the housing project officer role as in uh, your role? Um, and uh, you mentioned in, in your presentation Helen, that you, it's, it's really important to have a dedicated member of staff, but we know that a lot of communities find it difficult to, to find that revenue funding. Yeah, it's definitely an issue. And as Julie has mentioned, um, there's a lot of uh, weight on volunteer shoulders to, to keep projects going. And when you're working full time elsewhere, it, it's not easy. Um, my post was originally funded through the Scottish Land Fund. Um, and a bits of funding from through HIE and then more recently the Princess Countryside Fund and Nationwide Foundation but that is a stress um, when you're trying to secure development funding to actually finding funding for your own post as well um, so I would be really in favour of future rounds of both Scottish Land Fund and Rural Housing Fund including revenue funding for project officers because if they're going to provide um, development funding they really need to support people to to make these things happen as well. Sorry, thank you. Um, Hugh, you have some experience of, of uh, funding a role as well and staffing. Yeah, uh, the funding here, Mike, is uh, HIE's Community Capacity Programme, which has been uh, several years now. Um, that's due to come to an end, uh, end of March coming. I'm not actually sure what's going to happen beyond that. Um, we're hopeful of trying to, you know, get kind of income in to kind of cover that. But basically from day one, HIE obviously like this project because it's a big infrastructure project, but that's one note of caution I would say to our trust is there's not a great deal of profit or income in it for, for a trust. You know, the, it's obviously not about an income, but, you know, it still needs to provide an income so the trust can be sustainable going forward and look after the development. Um, so that's something that um, the board are very aware of. Uh, we're looking at other ways of getting more money into the development, uh, not just through funding, but um, it's something that the trust has you know, had to be quite cute about over the years. Um, so that, that yes, I, I would agree with Helen. That's something that it's not helpful knowing that you know possibly your job's not going to exist in six months' time. Great, and and yeah, obviously reference there to the importance but but also the the you know an important part of your role becomes finding the next tranche of funding which occupies a significant amount of time as <clears throat> as well um so a uh, david stewart from the land commission has asked a question about uh the role of working with enablers um which uh, i should probably not listen to um but uh I know that um, Hugh and, and Julia, you've both referenced um, working Hugh with with Communities Housing Trust and Julia. We've we've worked with with you and uh, Tim. You are an enabler, um, so can I ask you guys to to just uh, touch upon um, the, the the nature of that relationship, perhaps, uh, and uh, start with uh, Hugh, please. It's um, been a very good relationship, uh, Mike. Um, you know, I mean, Highland Housing Trust and La Hoss and Sky have been here from, uh, along with the trust from day one. So they've attended very difficult meetings with the Crofting Township. Um, you'd be amazed how uh, passionate crofters can get about a new frank. Um, and that's, you know, been quite kind of, um, I think it's reassuring for the trust and the board that they're always kind of uh, available. And willing to travel for meetings and uh, you know you know give their input 
Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're coming, they've been over the course many times before. Uh, we've got a board of directors here quite capable. For example, we've got businessmen, we've got a guy who's got his own groundworks kind of business. Um, you know, we've got a, a, a former prison governor, so it's all quite helpful in kind of sorting through you know, the project. But, you know, I feel that um, I don't, there's not a chance that the trust would have done this, uh, was capable to do this all on its own. Um, and I would like to think that, you know, the other two organisations, they're getting a lot out of working with the trust. Um, well, Haas and Sky, you know, um, they also very helpful to work with, but I suppose they kind of work a bit more conventionally. And, they, you know, I would, uh, you know, they, they took, I think it took a wee while to kind of understand how it was going to work. Um, and it might have felt cleaner to them that if they got presented with a the site, then they, they just built the houses themselves. But then we wouldn't have got the health center, we wouldn't have got the business units, and it might have been harder for us to convince the, the, the township, for example, to sell the land. Um, so that's kind of part of the, the overall kind of story. Um, as I said earlier on, it makes it slightly more protracted. We've got an issue with the contractor at the moment who, who's gone over you know, his budget for groundworks and damaged the, the public road. Uh, that's taken two or three meetings between all three organisations, but um, I know that I can pick up the phone to any of the organisations at any time and, and they'll be kind of, you know, be able to either answer me there or, you know, get back to me. So it's been a big kind of um, a strength and, you know, it's I think it's developed the trust, uh, its skills as well. So um, I would certainly, if any trust was going to go down this road, you know, I, I would certainly be looking to work alongside, you know, organisations like that. Okay, thank you, um, Julia. Um, and uh, I have to say that for, from the perspective of our organisation, um, all roads lead to Whitehorn have been a pleasure to, to work with. And I, I know that uh, Stacey has enjoyed the experience very much of, of working with, with your organisation. Um, but uh, uh, can you can you tell us a bit about uh, the, 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 that kind of external support, I guess, when you as an organisation don't have staff, um, particularly around some of the more hands on stuff uh, related to, to funding applications, etc. Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we didn't set out to do housing. And um, although we have some experience on board, um, of funding applications. It wasn't specifically in relation to housing funding, which has its own particular um, com complexities. So the Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust supported us with that. I mean, it was just a matter of knowing how to navigate it and knowing who to go to. Um, the process of consulting the community that was carried out um, through the Small Communities Housing Trust. And in a way that was good because it, acted as a sort of um, honest broker. It wasn't a, wasn't a set of local people asking intrusive questions about people's housing needs. It was a third party. Um, so I think, yeah, from the point of view of a, a, a board of volunteers, the Housing Trust has been um, a, a sort of a, a sounding board for, for any problems that we have and also um, there were polite reminders occasionally about deadlines, which was always good. Um, coming from Stacy, where there was a, a need to produce a part of the business plan. But I mean, I think in general, the, the relationship's gone well. It's a bit like a ping pong match, providing both people are sending back those important emails or documents at a regular pace, then it works. And um, it's good to know that Stacy felt it did. Thank you. Um... Tim, um, you must feel that the presence of Wessex Community uh, assets has had a significant impact upon the the upscaling, um, the the level of delivery around community led housing, and that your role has been important in that. Yeah, I think it has. I mean, but coming back to this question about um, sort of enabling hubs and and also this question about how they're funded. Um, so most, well, our funding comes from a combination of grants and, but we also get fees from housing associations. So for every 
house that gets planning permission, we get about three thousand pounds from the housing association. Um, so that's good in that it then pays for the next tranche of support that we're able to give to community housing groups. But I think the downside is that it it kind of puts a bit of a pressure to encourage those community groups to choose a housing association partnership route as opposed to giving them you know a very open sort of set of options um, so we've also tried to be a bit creative about funding as well so for example in Bridport we got some funding from the Arts Council to bring in some architects called Assemble who worked in Liverpool with the Grand Before Streets uh, project and they won the Turner Art Prize for that and so our local um, arts council in the southwest were keen to fund them to come down to Bridport and to think about basically a uh, sort of community self-build project that we want to develop and not working with a housing association so we've had to sort of find other ways of funding these different types of, of projects um, and I guess the the message in terms of policy is um, there has been a lot of talk in England about enabling hubs becoming somehow self-funded in particular through these kind of fees that they assign to community housing groups or to housing associations and I think that's a terrible way to enable uh, the development of community housing I think there has to be government funding and then supported as well by foundations like Nationwide to make this happen. I think the idea that this can all become self-funded in the long run is a bit of a fantasy. Um, yes, that I, I, I'm pleased to hear you make that point, Tim, and um, I think that's equally valid within the, the, the Scottish context and, and uh, the, the enabling organisations. Um, Helen, you, 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 I know you, you had worked um, uh, to, to get some support around doing your housing needs and demand work, but you mentioned as well that you had done the business planning yourself, having taken that experience from already being through a housing project initially. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, I just, uh, well, we were looking at the feasibility work and, and what feasibility funding was available um, it seemed that there was funding there for a consultant or enabler to come in and, and do the work. But I think because I was just in the thick of it, we literally just moved our tenants in and started on on phase two straight away. And, I, and because there was funding for my post, I decided just to, to crack on with it myself. Um, but, you know, not everyone has that that option to do that. And uh, but that, that worked for us. I just felt I knew exactly what the issues were. It was all very fresh in our minds from, from first time round. Great, thank you. Um, one quick specific question that we've had for, for Julia relates to refurbishing a historical building for community-led housing and, and asking you um, where you have uh, been able to derive other sources of funding uh, from to, to plug that gap over and above the Rural Housing Fund and, and borrowing and the Scottish Land Fund? Um, we applied to the Town Centre Capital Fund, which I think ultimately comes from the Scottish Government, but it was um, mediated by our local council. That just happened to come up at a very um, handy time. So um, that actually gave us a full 100,000, which um, we were able to use either on fees or construction. Um, so that's been the main, um, the main contributor. We were also lucky in getting a little bit extra when we felt that some of the exterior works, the site works were gonna maybe be slightly over what we had anticipated. So we went to the Architectural Heritage Fund uh, there was an initial um, project viability stage and then um, there's a slightly larger fund. So that came through just sort of in the nick of time. Um, and clearly that that's relevant to anybody dealing with a historic building that is either listed or has a significant conservation um, importance for the community. So, so those are our two extra funds. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a question. Uh, we're, we're beginning to come to the end of our, of our time slot, but we have a, a question specifically from Barbara about developing localised allocations policy and uh, how you've gone about doing that. I'm not going to ask Julia because I know that we haven't done that yet, although we, we did produce an allocations policy for your rural housing fund application. Um, but uh, Helen and Hugh, you've been in, in the midst of that, and I'll maybe ask him to to, to, to touch upon these issues of, of decision making as well. Um, uh, south of the border, uh, Helen, can I ask you about how you allocate homes? I know you mentioned this in your presentation, but um, yeah, basically, um, back in whenever it was 2015, 2016, I started looking at other examples of allocation policies. So, um, Angela. And Noidart was really helpful um, and went through all the various uh, things that they had done. And then I also looked at our own local social housing, a uh, Home Argyle uh, application form. In the end, it's a kind of diluted version of that. But in the midst of all that was a lot of community consultation. And, and some people had very strong opinions about certain people should not be allowed to apply for a house because they already owned a home or they shouldn't be allowed to apply for whatever reason and in the end I think you can't stop people applying but it's how you award points to prioritise people who don't own a home or who have um, specific housing needs or first time round it was all about for us it was about families so the more and the younger children that you had you gave more points to and a bit of advice that I was given was when you're sort of finalising your, application, uh, your allocation policy is to have an imaginary um, household in mind that would that would meet all your criteria and point that imaginary or real family or, or household against your policy and then other households and see how they match up and that helps you kind of tweak it a bit. But it's a lot of toing and throwing, a lot of meetings, just everyone to air all their concerns and um, yeah, a lot of toing and throwing with it till you finally get to consensus. Okay, thank you. Um, you, you're anticipating a significant level of interest in, in the homes that you're building. Yes, Mike. Um, I was talking to Helen about this a few weeks ago. We've not actually started um, drafting the document. Um, but like Helen, we went to, I spoke to Paul Harrington up in Helmsdale in Sutherland. They were similar to staff and they hadn't, hadn't had housing for about 30 years or so. And they were working with a housing association, Albion up there. They had their own specific allocation policy, which was geared to the aims of the project. So we would be looking to do something very similar to that. So aims of this project are obviously to kind of keep the school role going, uh, increase the population, provide housing for families and uh, young people. So the allocation policy would be kind of, um, you know, slanted towards making sure that people who filled it out, you know, scored enough points and then were kind of awarded um, you know, the houses. The thing about this development is the um, Staff and Trust houses, uh, there's six houses on the main site and the Staff and Trust will own two of them and our partners will own, own number four. But we can't have the situation where the board of directors here are deciding on who goes into the Staff and Trust houses. So the Hoffs and Sky will manage the houses on the Staff and Trust, um, uh, will, will manage the houses for the Staff and Trust so the allocation policy, I would imagine, will be on our website, so anybody locally can see it, apply, apply for it, but then they'll be going through, I keep doing this because Patrice that way, but the Halston Sky, his offices are on Patrice, so they would be dealing with them about going into the houses. So that takes away, you know, the board of directors here who all live locally, if there's any accusations of nepotism about who goes into the houses. But it's obviously all about making sure that uh, the people that get the houses uh, meet the aims of the project. That, that's what we're trying to do. But I'll, I'll be tapping up Helen for more uh, help on that soon and uh, we'll try and get going on that in the, in the springtime. Great, thank you. And um, Tim, can I ask you quite quickly, we are, we are running out of time, but you know, in terms of that process of allocating or decision making around um, who is given uh, the, the houses and, and the projects you work on, um, is is the, the, the does the process kind of ring bells uh, that we're discussing here in Scotland? Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of sharing of you know allocation policies across districts or 
counties and but I think this point that Hugh was making is the critical one that um, it's very important that the community is involved in drawing up the allocations policy but not then making those final decisions um, so finding some kind of trusted third party to do the final allocation is is the critical thing I think okay great thank you very much indeed and it is a uh half past 12, so we've stuck pretty nicely to, to time. So um, just, just to close off, um, thank you to everybody who's, who's been in the audience today. Um, we're going to ask you uh, from Community Land Scotland to complete a short feedback survey that is going to be sent to you. Um, for those of you who are here from communities uh, and aren't yet members of Community Land Scotland, can we ask you please to consider membership? Um, you can find out about that on Community Land Scotland's website. Um, and uh, we're going to have a link posted, I think. Um, and the one other point to make is that, that um, CLS are going to continue to do these Meet the Pioneer uh, sessions running up until March next year. And if any of you have any specific suggestions around topics that you would like to see covered with community landowners in Scotland, then please do get in touch and let us know. Uh, and I'm going to finish by saying thank you very much indeed uh, to Helen, Hugh, Julia and Tim for uh, giving us their time and expertise and knowledge and, and inspiration today. Um, great. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, good afternoon.